topics that seems ubiquitous it's going to affect every industry and every every job to a certain degree um in some way or another either directly or indirectly and what i'd really love to talk about with you is is how it's impacting supply chain specifically and supply chain management and what are some of those you know fundamentally what is it um and then what are some of those key benefits and challenges that you see you know we're going to get into some more of that as we go but just generally i mean what do we talk about when we talk about how ai is currently transforming supply chain management Companies um, like the idea of AI, but they're trying to figure out what to do with it and how to actually uh, make it efficient for their particular context. But after talking to companies and everything else, everybody's trying to do this holistic type of uh, high pie in the sky type of approach for AI and not really developing AI from the ground floor of what intelligence actually is. So that's another impetus for this for this study and looking at um, technology and the human interface, because, again, at the end of the day, we have to input, <laughs> you know, AI can only go so far. We were talking to a company a consulting firm and their idea was to um, work with their clients in, in determining much more of a AI type of approach. In other words, they were saying, hey, invest more in robotics, invest more in these particular types of issues in order to be more efficient. So that means get rid of people. And which, you know, I think at the end of the day, companies are trying to do that to a certain extent is to get that labor uh, uh, cost down and they see what they can do with AI and pattern recognition, those particular type of things. So we were saying, hey, that really is not the case because the AI can only go so far. So now we get to this idea of transformation of supply chain and that's where, um, the uh, human interaction comes in. So again, AI recognizes patterns and everything else, but uh, as we all know, creativity, innovation, everything else still comes from humans. So AI is gonna take away jobs, uh, which is designed to do and become much more efficient, but at the same time, it's gonna uh, allow humans, us, to be a lot more efficient in terms of interacting with and being creative and innovative and developing other areas. So I, I um, I'm of the matter that there's no, I mean, we can't, we're going to lose jobs, and we're going to, but we're going to end up changing the way we interact with the technology. And that means we're creating more jobs as we understand what's going on. For example, Atlanta is, is huge in traffic and everything else. If we have a problem in traffic and we need to coordinate to get something moving in our DC in order to deliver something here at five o'clock in the afternoon, well, then people need to know what's going on. And that data can be much more real time because we have, you're using AI to understand the traffic patterns. We're using AI to understand what would happen if, um, and, and now we're using our knowledge and our expertise to interact with that particular um, delay in traffic and that, that crash or whatever the case may be. And we can still manage our goods within the warehouse and then let our customer know what's happening on the other end and say, hey, we won't be there at 5, we'll be there, oh yeah, at 5.10, so to speak. Because we, we know the patterns, we know AI is taking care of all the pattern recognition, but we as humans interact and say, hey, this is what's going to really happen. So I guess when we look at roles in supply chain today, what roles might see the earliest augmentation or potentially replacement by AI versus what roles um, are, are going to be super critical and, and maybe even grow get, given AI's proliferation? I'm trying to tell the students because they're always asking about, well, if we're handling this data and we understand this data and this data is taken over for us in terms of pattern recognition, those particular type of things, then what's in it for us at the end of the day? And I still say, hey, well, you guys are risk managers. You're not just supply chain gurus. You're going to be risk managers. And it's all about understanding the risks associated with it. And we understand risk or we can at least interpret what's happening with risk. So all we're doing is just using AI to help manage that particular risk management portfolio. Um, and again, I go back to uh, human interaction. I mean, your business is you cannot handle business without trust. And that is, we're not going to get trust on the AI basis. We can use some of that information or data, really. We turn that into information, really. And, uh, and we put our uh, knowledge and everything else, and that endangers trust. 
coming down to the practical level and whether you're an executive in an organization in the C-suite who's trying to do some, some longer term planning or make large decisions strategically, or you're at that execution level in, in the warehouse, maybe you're a warehouse manager or, or whatever else. Let's, can we talk a little bit about some of the, the successful examples that you've seen in your research um, of, around implementing AI in supply chain management? One of the things is understanding people. And, and another reason why we're getting into this uh, transformation idea is be, in uh, the interaction of human is because in, the, in this particular company, what they were doing was looking at people processes and what people were actually doing, going back to just uh, management one-on-one. And they were determining their process from that. So they were asking the people, well, what kind of data do you want? Do we want big data or do we want small data? And, and at the end of the day, uh, the people uh, were actually, this is on a, a manufacturing place, the people are actually looking at small data. We just want to know what we need to do today or to do our jobs. So that idea of packing the small data is good because now we t- we're, instead of just inundating people with a bunch of dashboards and stuff like that, what we're doing, we change the dashboards around and we said, okay, this is what we need to do for the aggregate, the, 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 the manager. But for the person that needs to do the job, this is the information that you need. This is the data that you need. And they went from the ground floor from that. But they did this from the, uh, the very ground floor. They asked the uh, people what they were actually doing, what the kind of data they needed. And they filtered that data for that particular aspect of it. Now the process came in where they started talking to each other. And that created a little more knowledge. So now the, uh, what do we need to work with each other? Everybody has a, a buyer, everybody has a supplier. I'm doing something and I hand it off to somebody. I'm getting something from somebody. So that interaction was all they needed to do their jobs. So instead of trying to get holistic about it, all you're doing is re- being responsive to your immediate partner. And that helped uh, increase the efficiency of the processes very much. That creates intelligence on the, on the uh, if you think about it, because now we can innovate and work with each other. And it actually did increasing the uh, efficiency of their uh, particular area. What are some of those really, you know, granular examples of where it did work to that small data, to your point? Because I think that's, for most of our audience, I think that's really where they're trying to say, we're going to point to something and say, that made a difference. And that process of going from uh, the granular, you know, what is this, the small data? I don't want the big data. Uh, the big data can be the managers. That's, that's the CEOs. That's everybody else. Okay. But the, uh, the, the small data is really what you want in order to compete. So how do we do our jobs here on the floor better? How do we manage this particular transportation lane better? What do we need in order for our loads to come through, et cetera? So what is that particular data? What inputs do we need? I need to know about two or three drivers. I don't need to know about the, all the my fleet. Uh, I don't need to know about all the lanes. I need to know about the lanes I'm, uh, I'm actually working with and the loads that I'm working with on this particular lane. Um, and matter of fact, we're doing, doing that now with a, with a, with a company in, in Birmingham on looking at lanes. So um, that's what they're, what they're trying to do is look at that small data. The aggregate data comes in and we can play with that aggregate data because that gives us a, a better way to compete in the aggregate level. However, when I filter it down to this particular, uh, this guy is managing this lane that I'm looking at now, he doesn't need to know all that other stuff. Um, and, and I think that's that's just management one on one. To be honest, with you, Alex, and but we lose sight of that because we have the sexy idea of AI and what it can do for us, and uh, it goes back to actually building what intelligence actually is from the ground floor up. If a supply chain professional would come to you today, at whatever role they are in an organization, you can pick at whatever level they're at the strategic level, the execution level, whatever, and they say, you know, Tony, what's What's smoke? What's fire? You know, where 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 can I really get? Where should I look? And and how can I really look to apply AI today? If if I were to go back, I would want to know what actually true knowledge is, and how to apply that knowledge and disseminate that knowledge. So if I was applying AI, I'd want that data coming in, and I want to understand what that data is, so I can get down to that um, that small data for my my worker and my employee. And make sure that he or she can actually do their jobs and do their jobs well. Now, that knowledge dissemination um, will go from from your employees to each other. So, again, I would apply it to uh, understanding how to capture knowledge and how to disseminate knowledge. The data, AI is just data. It's just data analytics on on steroids. 
uh, machine learning and all these particular type of things that are underneath AI is just glorified math mathematics uh, and people doing a lot of pretty stuff in order to be, you know, to sell their, their, their stuff. But that's all. I mean, I'm, I'm making, I'm being silly, but at the end of the day, it really is that knowledge, that knowledge transfer uh, among your employees. And that is the grassroots level of how intelligence, real intelligence, is developed. We were talking to a company, an airline company. They were working with blockchain. And they've been working with blockchain since blockchain came out, you know, jumped on the bandwagon. They still haven't implemented it across because of all the rules and regulations and everything else associated with how the, with the FAA and the, et cetera. They also are dealing with a lot of uh, the aircraft, not just you know, all the stuff associated with aircraft and we know the Boeings because that's their primary aircraft. So we know all the issues associated with that. So how do you use AI or excuse me, blockchain in order to share all that information? And and um, they're having a devil of a time trying to do that because of all this coming in and information they can and cannot share. So if you go on a uh, grassroots level, and talk to your employee and start from the ground forward, then you can start building up um, and sharing what you need to share with your partner. It's management one-on-one. I, I don't want to make it simple, but it kind of is. It's just blocking and tackling. You know, it's funny you mentioned blockchain. I mean, there were, there was not too many years ago where if a CEO got up in front of his board or, or in front of the market and said they were implementing blockchain, their stock price would shoot up just because the, the phrase was mentioned, <laughs> right? Um, AI is a little like that right now, but... This is a great example. You know, there's there's so many more complexities and, and uh, um, dependencies on making sure blockchain or AI in this case can be successful. Warehouse management systems, they're looking to leverage AI in terms of what they're doing for a customer. Then you've got edge technology like robotics or whatever else are trying to find a way to use AI. And you've got the customer sitting there saying, well, it's my data and, and I'd like to use it. You, you already create knowledge. So what you're trying to do is capture that value. Okay, and capture the value for the long haul. So I think part of that is just basically um, understanding where your people are and how to get those people to be able to make decisions on the floor um, and uh, having them understand what they need to do, the data they need to make those particular decisions. Right. So, yeah. I, so I think that's where the, that capturing that value comes in. And, and I'm, I'm making a distinction between creating value and capturing value because you want that sustainable uh, performance. So that comes again, the knowledge and decision making and uh, uh, providing that empowerment to people. I, I, again, it's 101, but it's using the AI to do that uh, and using that AI to understand that, uh, the visibility, where to go get that data and what data you need to go get. And I think we lose that in, in, the, in the battle a lot of times. It, it seems super simple, and but but it's a really it's insightful, Tony. Honestly, because like we, we talk a lot in our in in our space, um, you know, it's it's the worker at the pick face grabbing that. You know, that's the most great. Let's you start there, and then let's extrapolate back to other things. And where and and you're and I love the idea of creating value, capturing value. For years, we've been about creating value. You know, how can we do it faster, more accurate, safer? Those things. And I think I think most most companies in our space, that's the way they're thinking. But to your point, it's about there's there's knowledge traveling through there. Capture it, turn it into something usable, communicate it, share it. Yeah, that's that's I, I think again, I know you keep saying, well, I keep going back to that. That's really the right, yeah. that's the right call. No, I think you're right, because if you if you that capture value, you you want to innovate, you want to be continuously innovating. So if you if, the, if your people understand what's going on and how, why they need this particular data in order to go get this particular point, uh and what they're actually doing at the end of the day. That is a way of innovating, and you let the people innovate. And again, uh, that is artificial knowledge. I mean, if we think about the brain, we're teaching them, we have little chunks of knowledge, and then we start making these connections and everything else. And that is from the grassroots level, uh, from your people just understanding, hey, this is stuff that's coming in, why it's coming in, uh, was happening. They input their knowledge uh, to whatever patterns they see today um, or the week or whatever the case may be. And then they pass that particular knowledge and expertise on to the next person. And they do that's how, And we do that all the time. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, to be honest with you, yeah. it's just we we get enamored by this this sexy technology 
and the ML and deep learning and everything else, which is fine. And I like that anyway, but I think we lose sight of uh, what artificial intelligence actually is or what intelligence, excuse me, intelligence actually is. And if we're going to mimic the brain, kids don't start off knowing everything. I mean, uh, they, yeah. they have to start off and uh, we don't. And it, whatever class we take, uh, we have to start off from the building blocks. And uh, I think we lose sight of that. And, and I would argue that a lot of companies do the same. Yeah, there's a reason they don't sign a book report for War and Peace in Kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 